of this organization. I'm going to try and honor that tradition uh, tonight. In those early years of the CIA, in the, in the 1920s and the 1930s, one of the uh, useful things that the CIA did was to help um, share perspectives with Canadians about some alternate forms of political organization that were being tried out in Europe. This was obviously a very turbulent time, a time of some extreme uh, economic crisis, uh, some extreme social crisis, and in the cauldron of post-World War I Europe, there were uh, alternate uh, ideas being implemented about how society should be organized, and some of those had some purchase in, uh, in Canada. Uh, we also were extreme, uh, experiencing some extreme social and economic uh, disruption in the 1930s with the Great Depression, uh, and there, were, there was sympathy in Canada to some of the rivals to liberal democracy on the left and on the right, and one of the useful things that the CIA could do was to share some perspectives on how some of these ideas work out in practice in other countries and bring those perspectives back to Canadians. And in that light, I'd like to offer uh, some perspectives on populism and how that has played out uh, in practice, in uh, primarily drawing on my experience in Venezuela, where I served as Canada's ambassador from 2014 to 2017, and then drawing out what I believe are some parallels uh, with uh, the populist rule of uh, Donald Trump in the United States. Um, Venezuela might seem like a, a very different country from ours and therefore difficult to draw lessons from Venezuela uh, to here. And certainly the current situation of Venezuela is uh, radically different from Canada, and thank God for from a Canadian perspective. Um, but in fact, I think it is a useful country uh, case for us to look at because Venezuela was in fact the richest uh, most democratic country in Latin America with extremely, um, extremely strong traditions of, uh, of human rights. Um, it was the first country to reject and to overthrow military dictatorship in Latin America in 1958, so a full generation before the rest of, uh, of Latin America. It was the 1980s that most, uh, most Latin American countries had to, to wait in order to transition to democracy. And Venezuela had been at the forefront of that, uh, of that effort. And then having been the, the sort of uh, forebearer of, uh, demo, of uh, democratic transition in Latin America, Caracas then served as the, uh, as the, uh, the central meeting point for democracy and human rights activists throughout the Spanish-speaking uh, Latin American world. So some of, the, uh, some of the activists that were driven into exile, for example, in 1973 coup in Chile found refuge in Caracas. And some of the great novels of Latin America uh, were written in Caracas. In that time, we think about the novels of uh, Isabella Allende and, uh, and her uh, accounts of the, um, of the horrors of the, uh, of the Pinochet regi regime. Venezuela is also interesting because it experienced a degree of economic disruption um, that was uh, really quite extreme in the 1980s and 1990s. And while it's different from the kind of economic disruption that we're experiencing now with the, the, with the, the, the arrival of the digital economy, and the tremendous dislocations that that's uh, presenting to established economic models. It shows you how uh, political, uh, the, the political reaction to uh, some of the instability that comes from, uh, from, uh, from a market economy run, uh, run amok. Um, I will make some observations about, uh, about populism, and I think to start, I should offer a definition so that uh, um, we have a, a common reference point. If any of you want to take issue with how I'm describing populism, it is a contested term, um, as all great concepts in political science are. Um, but I believe that there's a, um, a, a definition that's been gaining currency uh, among both academic uh, and uh, media observers of, uh, of populism that serves our purpose as well here. So I'm going to use the definition offered by Cass Mood who is a, a US-based uh, political scientist who identifies three claims that are central to populism. The first is that uh, the nation is fundamentally divided, and irrevocably divided between the elite and the people, or the pure people. The second is that the elite are corrupt, meaning that they are using their benefits drawn from their public office or the, the, of their wealth to advance private interests, and that they do so in some kind of coordination amongst themselves. And then the third is that the people have a single unified will, that there is, there is something called the popular will um, that can be, uh, that can be uh, deduced. That's not the aggregation of the individual wills of millions of people in society, but in fact some, um, some separately existing 
popular role. Um, I believe these, uh, these ideas resonate, not just in the Venezuela of the 1990s and the, and the early 2000s, uh, but in any society where there is growing income inequality and when there are economic outcomes that are seen as profoundly unfair to many people in society, when institutions that were established many decades or even centuries ago no longer seem up to the task of responding to the challenges that society faced. This is more or less the situation that Venezuela faced in the, uh, in the, eight, uh, in the 80s and 90s. A little bit of background. I should actually ask, ¿hay unos venezolanos aquí? Ah, bueno, para ustedes será un poco ridículo escuchando una opinión uh, canadiense sobre la situación en Venezuela, pero les invito a compartir sus, per sus, uh, sus perspectivas después. Um, at the risk of uh, telling Venezuelans about their country, uh, in, for the benefit of those of you that haven't had the, uh, the pleasure to live uh, in Venezuela, um, as I mentioned, in 1958, it became the first country to, in, in Latin America to embrace liberal democracy. Uh, and it had a, a regular rotation in, uh, in political parties throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, Venezuela has both the blessing and the curse of sitting on the world's largest proven oil reserves, larger than Saudi Arabia's, uh, and that was a tremendous source of, uh, of wealth uh, as far back as the 1920s. I believe uh, it was in the 1910s that, uh, that oil was discovered in, uh, in Venezuela. And in the 1970s, when the world price of oil shot through the roof, the, uh, the, the, the inflow of income into Venezuela was uh, really quite extraordinary. That had um, some uh, long-term uh, impacts uh, on, uh, on Venezuela. One of them was the emptying of the countryside as, uh, as uh, people living in rural areas saw opportunities for uh, economic growth in the cities. There was a massive uh, migration to, uh, to cities like Caracas. Uh, and, and Maracaibo, the center of the oil industry. Um, the city was totally unable to handle that, and so the emergence of, a, uh, of a, an urban poor. But in the 1970s, when there was so much money coming into the country, there was confidence that they would be able to uh, accommodate and, uh, uh, and absorb uh, that mass migration. Um, in the time before Chavez, uh, and Venezuela's economy was reliant on income from oil for 75% of the national for its national revenue. Um, so you can imagine the impact when there's a sudden change in the price of oil. And that's exactly what happened in 1982 when the price of oil dropped from, uh, I think it was about $79 after the 1979 oil shock to $9 in 1982, and it was, uh, it was virtually overnight. So when 75% of your revenue comes uh, from that, you can imagine what a tremendous external shock that was in the Venezuelan, uh, in the Venezuelan economy. There were um, many economic reform uh, programs introduced after that to try and uh, accommodate that shock, but it's pretty difficult for any country to, uh, to, to respond to that. Just think of the impact that the drop, a much less dramatic drop in the price of oil in, 19, in 2014 had on the, econ on the economy of Alberta. Uh, and this is a country in Canada where we rely on the sale of oil and gas for only 3% uh, of our national revenue. For Alberta, it's obviously much more than 3%. Uh, but the price dropped from, by, from about half, so from roughly about $100 per barrel to about uh, $45 per barrel. And yet that still had quite a, a dramatic impact on the economy of, uh, of Alberta. So imagine when it goes from $79 to, uh, to $9. Um, the story of the 1980s and the 1990s was of growing uh, inequality between the rich and the poor. It was particularly this uh, urban poor in the barrios, the, the, the shanty towns around uh, Caracas and, and other large cities. Um, of, uh, of growing political dissatisfaction in the sense that the established political institutions, Congress, the political parties, the courts, were not able to come up with solutions to address uh, some of the challenges of the society. Um, so in that context rose a very charismatic figure, uh, Hugo Chavez, who uh, had a novel uh, explanation for the problems, and that was that the institutions themselves were the problem uh, at, the, at the root of the of the ills of society in Venezuela. Um, at the risk of oversimplifying, I believe that uh, there were four elements that were um, emblematic of Chavez's approach to, uh, to uh, governing Venezuela. The first was his claim that Venezuela, the divisions in Venezuela uh, were profound um, and that the, uh, 
the problem in the society was that the the true Venezuelans, and he had, he uh, identified the, the urban poor as the true Venezuelans, um, were in a constant struggle against other Venezuelans, a, um, um, a rich versus poor dynamic. Uh, instead of trying to bridge those differences or to paper over them, he identified them as the central problem of Venezuelan politics. The second is his claim uh, that the sovereignty of Venezuela was uh, under attack or that it was even in some sense illusory. That the United States uh, obviously um, uh, an antagonistic to, uh, to the left-wing project of, uh, of Hugo Chavez and with a, <coughs> very, uh, an unfortunate sordid history of uh, abuse of power in the region. Um, but Chavez went one step further than the, the anti-American sentiment that's quite common and to be honest quite understandable in most of, uh, of Latin America by claiming that fundamental decisions in Venezuela were still being taken in Washington, that the, uh, that the sense that Venezuela uh, was a, an independent sovereign nation was to, extend, to some extent uh, an illusion. Um, the third was a, a tremendous talent for governing by emotion. Um, this was one of the most charismatic uh, political figures in, uh, in Latin American history in a, in a region of the world that's produced quite a lot of charismatic leaders. Uh, I remember some of the impact that, that Chavez had had on my, on my colleagues. I never actually met him because I arrived in Venezuela in 2014, the year after his death. Um, but engaging in some of the, uh, engaging some of the uh, fellow heads of mission of other uh, embassies in their memories of having dealt with Chavez I was really struck by one uh, ambassador who was particularly hard-nosed, had kind of been everywhere and done everything and seen everything and had that kind of professional skepticism of the, of the professional uh, diplomat, except for when he related his story about presenting his uh, letters of credential uh, to Chavez, because Chavez had this un unerring ability to connect with people. In this particular case, I think he remembered the name of the soccer team from the, 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 the town in remote northwestern Argentina, where he came from, uh, and knew the names of some of the players on the on the team, or something like that. And uh, this diplomat, like, literally got a sort of misty-eyed look when he, <laughs> he recounted his his account. Well, you can imagine if that was a professional diplomat, uh, how he would have uh, the connection he would have made with the urban poor, who had felt for so many years that they were being completely ignored by uh, the political institutions and by uh, people in positions of uh, of authority. For him to then not only to uh, claim that they were the real people uh, of Venezuela, the heart and soul of the nation, um, but to be one of them and to connect with, with one of them was a, was a, a tremendously powerful uh, experience. Um, he had a unique gift for communications and placed a, an inordinate amount of, it, of attention on uh, communications. Uh, this was in the pre-internet era, and so the, print, the preferred medium of Chavez was television. He hosted his own television program, which was called Ado Presidente, and which took, uh, which took to the air uh, every Sunday, I believe it was. Um, it was pretty extraordinary in any country to imagine that the president or the prime minister would spend several hours on live TV talking to the entire nation. Um, uh, but he would uh, prioritize uh, his time around that television program. It got to the point, there's this fantastic documentary by um, John Lee Anderson of the, of the New Yorker, which I highly recommend, called the, the Hugo Chavez Show, um, which uh, documents how cabinet ministers that had difficulty accessing the president because he wouldn't have regular cabinet meetings would actually show up at the television studio and have to come on as guests on the television program <laughs> in order to brief the president on what was happening in education. And if he didn't like the briefing, there was some, you know, this was TV, right? So it had to be kind of entertaining. He would sometimes fire ministers on the spot on, on, uh, on television. I mean, it would be ri riveting television. I, I tell you, Justin Trudeau was on every week, and it was you knew that he might be firing some uh, some cabinet minister. I think I'd, I'd probably be watching that as well. Um, but the emotions that he ruled by were not just those of uh, those of love and those of affection, but also of outrage. Um, it was politically useful to Chavez to alienate uh, those that he didn't see as his core constituency. It reinforced his overall narrative that the fundamental issue in Venezuelan politics was this ongoing conflict between the urban poor and the rich, uh, everyone else in the, uh, in the society. And so it served his uses, not the use, his purposes not only to have the kind of love and adulation of his preferred constituency, but also to have the anger and even the hatred of his political opponents because 
either of those emotions places the leader at the center of attention. We now talk about uh, the attention economy uh, and the, uh, the ability of a populist leader to, to dominate, uh, to monopolize the attention of everyone. Um, both sets of emotions are useful for that purpose, and that certainly was uh, the case with, uh, with Hugo Chavez. The kinds of topics that he would often um, focus on or that he'd bring up in his communications with the nation were uh, extremely divisive. There is this horrible experience that all um, Venezuelans, or at least uh, Caracanos, went through in 1989 called the Caracaso in one of the failed economic reform programs to try and stabilize the economy after the oil shock of the early 80s. Uh, there was a, a mass riot, essentially, that broke out across the entire city of Caracas and uh, led to a total breakdown in law and order for somewhere between a week and two weeks. The death toll uh, officially was somewhere in the 300s, and unofficially there were reports that there may have been 2,000 people killed. Anyone who lived in Caracas in that time has this memory indelibly imprinted on them. And it's uh, one of those situations, one of those historical memories that's just fundamentally divided, uh, divisive, uh, because how you see the, the Caracaso depends on where you stand in society. Um, and yet Chavez would continually revisit the memory and replay the memory of the Caracaso over and over and over again. Uh, the only historical comparison I can make in Canada would be if our prime minister uh, or uh, political leaders decided to replay the October crisis of 1970 somewhere where uh, an incident on which you know that Canadians uh, are divided in, in what that represents historically. There also in the coup attempt of 2002, there was an incident in which uh, several civilians were killed by uh, un, ununiformed um, gunmen on a, an urban bridge overlooking a, a, an intersection. Uh, and there were competing versions of the events of whether these were Chavistas firing a non-Chavistas or, uh, or vice versa. Again, yet a, a searing memory that was extremely divisive in the country and yet replayed over and over and over again with the goal to outrage, uh, to, to bond your supporters to you to, uh, and to alienate your, uh, your opponents. So there was this kind of governance by, uh, by spectacle. Um, now, I should say that uh, from all accounts, Chavez was uh, quite successful in the first decade of his time in office uh, in introducing significant uh, improvements in social and economic indicators for uh, the urban poor, um, uh, innovative social programs that managed to, uh, uh, to improve uh, health, health outcomes and uh, increase access to education. Um, and as a result, he was a figure of significance not only in Venezuela, but in many countries around the world who thought that perhaps there really was uh, a promising alternate, uh, alternative model uh, and perhaps there was. There, there were certainly some, some innovations still present by the time that I got to Venezuela. Uh, one that I thought was really quite interesting was the introduction of, um, of gondolas, like uh, ski, uh, like when you're in a, a ski resort or Whistler or what have you, but for uh, urban transportation. Um, traffic jams in, in Caracas are some of the worst in the world, and it can take two or two and a half hours, particularly for the poor who have to live very, very far away from where they work. And so they, they, they now have a system of gondolas that go across uh, uh, downtown uh, Caracas. Uh, and I, I think that's one of the few remaining um, indications of the real innovation that happened in social and economic policy. But it should also be pointed out that those advances in social and economic outcomes was financed by a massive oil bonanza. Uh, Chavez had the incredible historical fortune of living, of his, his 13 years of power being 13 years in which the oil price was at unprecedented levels in the international market, uh, fueled by the rise of China and others. The average price of oil um, was uh, above $100 a barrel. And if you take uh, the historical price of oil and then calculate the extra amount of money that Venezuela earned in that time, um, the, oil, the resulting oil bonanza has been estimated as much as $700 billion. So there's $700 billion of kind of unexpected money that enters into the Venezuelan economy between uh, 1998 and 2013. I can tell you by the time I arrived in 2014, there was very little signs that $700 billion had entered into the economy. It looked very similar to, by all accounts, what Venezuela had looked like in the 1990s. Uh, 
But the fourth characteristic of Chavez's uh, rule was, as I mentioned before, his contention that institutions aren't part of the problem, they're, part of the they're not part of the solution, they're part of the problem. His contention that institutions, uh, the institutions of the Venezuelan state were serving the interests uh, of the rich and not of the poor, and therefore that the institutions uh, were getting in the way. And over the course of the time that he was in power, there was a systematic attempt to either dismantle uh, or marginalize or to control the control of, uh, of institutions in Venezuelan society. Um, I wasn't there in that period of time, and so I can't comment on uh, how quickly this happened, but by the time I arrived in 2014, uh, the judiciary was entirely under the control of the president. There hadn't been a single uh, decision issued by any court in Venezuela that was contrary to the interests of the executive branch uh, of the government since at least 2007. Um, there was still some media freedom in that it was possible to, uh, uh, to hear opposition voices on, uh, on radio and there were mu certain newspapers that could, that could uh, voice independent opinions, but television uh, broadcasting had been very firmly, uh, the control had been taken by the, uh, by the, uh, by the government. The uh, legislature had been, uh, uh, had uh, lost its teeth, uh, lost its teeth. And federal, uh, if this is a federal state, and so some of the state governments um, had to experience the ignominy if they'd been, um, if they'd had the temerity of electing an opposition politician to be the governor of the state, uh, the Chavez government would create a parallel state government to run that state and to be the recipient of all the federal, uh, the federal funds. Um, it even went to the extent that um, the executive branch itself, so the, the part of the state that the president directly controls, was sometimes held out to be part of the problem and uh, uh, the enemy of the people of Venezuela. Some of the most significant economic and social innovations that were introduced were not delivered by, say, the Ministry of Health or by the Ministry of, the Edu of Education. He created what are called Bolivarian missions, were essentially out outgrowths of the political party, and it was these missions that would then deliver uh, medical assistance to the to the poor in the in the barrios uh, or what have you, while the respective institutions uh, of the Venezuelan state would uh, would wither, and there would uh, often be the Chavez would often rail against the corruption of the bureaucrats, uh, which uh, in a pre Donald Trump era struck me as quite strange. It's uh, essentially uh, the complaint about the, the the deep state, which is now uh, now part and parcel of all. Um, Chavez died in 2013. Uh, I arrived in 2014 and saw for a few months uh, the uh, Venezuela operating in, uh, in a relatively normal fashion. Uh, in December of 2014, however, <coughs> the pendulum changed uh, direction again with uh, a dramatic drop in the price of oil. This is the same shock that, of course, uh, Alberta is still recovering from now, uh, and that all oil exporting countries uh, suffered in December 2014. But the impact on Venezuela <coughs> far outstrips the impact on any other oil economy in the world. Uh, we've all heard tales of the depth of the humanitarian crisis that has uh, befallen Venezuela since then. Perspective: The estimates of the drop in GDP is on the order of somewhere between 60 and 65 percent, meaning that almost two thirds of the economy has disappeared. Uh, compare that to the Great Depression, where the estimate is that over the course of the uh, of the of the 1930s, Canada lost 33 percent, about a third of our economy uh, disappeared. And you can, I mean, we all can still feel the kind of historical legacy uh, that the that the Great Depression caused in our country. Imagine Dublin, that's what Venezuela is going through right now. Uh, we started noticing it first in Caracas, now admittedly as a diplomat, I was living in eastern Caracas, which is the richer part of the city, and so we wouldn't have witnessed the, the, the first signs of the, the damage that this caused to Venezuelan society. Uh, the first way that we noticed it was in the growing uh, lines around grocery stores. As the, uh, oil pr the food production had more or less been decimated by Dutch disease is a common phenomenon in, in oil con uh, oil producing countries where it becomes more economical to import food than to grow your own, even though Venezuela is probably the <coughs> easiest place in the world to grow agricultural, uh, any kind of agricultural products. 
70% uh, of all the food was, uh, was imported. But if you then dramatically reduce the revenue coming into the country, you don't have very much food being produced domestically and people can no longer afford imports. Essentially, shelves, in, whole entire shelves were being cleared out in, uh, in grocery stores. It started to take three, four, five hours to even wait in line to even get into a grocery store before you could, uh, you could buy food. Um, the response of the, um, of the Maduro government at this, point, at this point, Maduro was in power, um, was to double down on some of the, uh, on the, on the same political strategy that had been followed all along. So to focus on the divisions in the country, uh, they blamed the rich for the, for the economic crisis. The claim that the Venezuelan, the Venezuelan sovereignty is somehow illusory. Um, the, 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 the claim from Maduro back uh, as early as December 14, 2014, and up until now, is that there's an economic war being waged uh, against the uh, against Venezuela. Um, the uh, solution being presented is not necessarily any kind of economic policies to be implemented, but to further concentrate power in the hands of, uh, of Maduro uh, and his uh, and his uh, his clique. There was a um, uh, an election in December 2015 for the legislative branch, the National Assembly, uh, and after. 12 months of this really intense economic crisis, it's not surprising that the opposition party won those uh, elections in a landslide. Um, regardless of your view on politics, if your country is experiencing a very severe economic crisis, it's pretty natural for all citizens to want some kind of change. And so that converted into a desire to change uh, the, uh, the parties in power. That um, provoked some hope in the diplomatic community that now that there's divided power, uh, in, the, in the Venezuelan uh, state, uh, that the two sides will be forced to negotiate because one of them controls the legislative part of the government, the other controls the executive uh, uh, executive part. The economic crisis was at such a level that the, uh, the view of many diplomats was that um, any rational government would be forced now to negotiate some kind of uh, common approach to economic reform. Uh, if anything, there was uh, the opposite. The Maduro government essentially went to war against the legislature as soon as it lost control against the legislature. It uh, invalidated the election of several of the uh, of the MPs under uh, dubious claims. Uh, and as the political debates started to get more heated, uh, Maduro used his control of the Supreme Court, which is completely under his thumb, to issue a ruling that every piece of legislation coming out of the National Assembly is con inconstitutional. So there hasn't been a single bill passed by this National Assembly in the three and a half years that it's been in place that has ever become law. Essentially, the legislative function of the Venezuelan state just ceased to exist in December of, uh, of 2014. The oil, uh, the, sorry, the economic crisis got uh, worse and worse and worse. Um, I mentioned the impact in, in, uh, in foods, uh, food security. We started to notice it also in uh, uh, in the healthcare, uh, in health, the health sector, where uh, reports of um, infant mortality and maternal mortality started to rival those of Haiti. So, in a country that had had the highest economic and social outcomes for many, many years, to now rival a country that has the lowest was pretty striking. And frankly, it got uh, to the point where it was um, it was pretty scary when your own children uh, had to go to the emergency room because it quickly became obvious that there was no medicine available, even basic antibiotics for, for the kind of infection that children get all the time uh, were not present. Um, again, being diplomats, we had a recourse to other options. We essentially medevaced our children every time they got a cold or uh, a fever. Uh, Venezuela, of course, didn't have that luxury, and so the, the uh, level of um, uh, child mortality started and at this point, every family in Venezuela has a story of someone who has died unnecessarily because of otherwise relatively preventable medical uh, causes, whether an elderly, uh, an elderly relative or, or, uh, or a child. And that's really the case of many of the Venezuelan families that I know. Um, the food crisis got so serious uh, that many Venezuelans uh, started to lose weight. And just to give you a, an idea of the scale, of the uh, humanitarian crisis. In one year alone, 2016, 
the average weight loss by Venezuelans was 19 kilograms. <coughs> and of course, that's two and a half years ago. Things have only gotten worse. Now, this was caused by an external shock to the economy, the drop in the oil price. And yet, they were very clear and I think relatively obvious to an, uh, to an economist measures that could have been taken to offset the economic crisis. For example, the exchange rate. There were three different exchange rates in Venezuela. There were, in any case, it changes so frequently, I'm not entirely sure what the current situation was. But while I was there, the Bolivar, the local currency, was pegged at uh, 6.3 to the dollar. But the black market rate rose to at least 6,300. At one point, there was actually uh, a 1,000 fold difference between the value of the Bolivar in the official market and the black market. Um, it's quite common when currencies are controlled for the to be some kind of variation in uh, between the black market rate and the, and the free market rate. Um, the black market rate, the controlled market rate. Um, but in most countries, the variation is a matter of, uh, of percentage. When it's a thousand fold, you can imagine the economic incentives to anyone who has access to both exchange rates. Uh, and the, the reason that the Maduro government has maintained differing exchange rates, uh, con controlling exchange rates at such an unrealistic level is because of the benefit that it offers to officials in the government or in the armed forces that have access to, to exchange rates because they can engage in arbitrage that makes people millionaires in a very short order of time. That's one of the economic policy measures that um, could have been introduced many, many years ago to, to stop the hemorrhaging of any remaining wealth in the Venezuelan economy to this, uh, uh, to this essentially institutionalized form of corruption. I believe that the reason that the Venezuelan government wasn't able to take some of those measures to put, uh, to put an end to this crisis, to try and uh, staunch some of the bleeding of the, of the Venezuelan economy was because the political system had essentially been destroyed uh, by, uh, by populism. This insistence on the division of the country, the, uh, the all or nothing, the all-out warfare between different political uh, political factions, uh, and the the consequences of a, a change in government all make it very difficult for the for the uh, for the rational economic policy that would be needed to put an end to that. Um, this discussion, though, of course, is about how democracy dies. So I'll then walk you through what happened politically after this economic crisis reached uh, the the catastrophic um, extent that it. As I mentioned, the last free and fair election uh, occurred in December 2015 when the National Assembly um, uh, came under the control of the opposition parties. Uh, it was already surprising and significant, I think, that the Chavistas allowed that uh, democratic uh, result to stand. I believe it's because the uh, ability of Chavez and then Maduro to win elections was a part of a point of pride in, uh, in Chavismo. Um, there were there were, uh, there were certainly some aspects of Chavismo that were democratic, and one of them was the, the insistence on, on, uh, on elections and um, uh, pride, the pride taken by the government that they would consistently win these, uh, these elections. And yet, after 2015, there was uh, clearly a decision taken to make sure that there would never be free and fair elections uh, ever held again. The next election that was scheduled uh, or that was provided for in the Constitution was a recall referendum uh, for the president. The Venezuelan Constitution introduced by Chavez in 1999 places, uh, concentrates enormous power in the office of the president. Uh, the president is given a six-year term and is able to, to renew indefinitely. Uh, and the, the, the powers that are placed under the, the control of the president in the, in the Venezuelan Constitution that strip those of, uh, of most other uh, Latin American constitutions. But the one control mechanism is that when a certain number of votes, something like, or a certain number of signatures, 20% of the entire electorate, if uh, petitions can be signed by 20% of the electorate, the president is forced to subject, to be subjected to a referendum to potentially recall him from office. Chavez very famously faced one of these uh, recall referendums in 2004 and famously won, and that became then part of the story of what a genuine Democrat he was, that he had faced this challenge and that he had, uh, he had prevailed. Uh, Maduro was not willing to, uh, to sub subject himself to that kind of electoral contest. And so 
in October 2016, which was the, the, the last possible date at which this recall referendum could be held, um, there was essentially uh, bogus um, judicial decision by the Supreme Court uh, instructing the National Electoral Council not to proceed with the, with the recall referendum. That was the moment at which I and several other diplomatic observers in Caracas felt that the, the, the line had been crossed, that this is no longer a constitutional state, that there is no, uh, uh, there's no credible claim to Venezuela being a democracy after uh, such a flagrant violation of the Constitution. But it did take some time for uh, others to accept that. Uh, life continued, more or less, after October 2016, uh, as if nothing had changed and as if this was just another uh, another crisis. Um, this, to be honest, was a very awkward time for me as, uh, as ambassador, as uh, we were recommending, providing our advice uh, up to, uh, to Ottawa. Ottawa was seized with the fact that Donald Trump had just been elected president of the United States, partially on a, uh, on a platform of taking down um, NAFTA. Um, obviously, November 2016, it was very difficult to get uh, Ottawa to pay much attention to anything but the United States for understandable reasons. The United States matters an awful lot more uh, than Venezuela, but it was a lonely time uh, to be uh, someone who cared about democracy and human rights in Venezuela to see this, uh, this process uh, unravel. It didn't take very long, though, for the rest of the world to notice. In March of 2017, so only six months later, uh, the Maduro government decided to take moves against the National Assembly, initially sending in thugs to beat up some of the uh, some of the opposition pol parliamentarians, and and then to issue a decree uh, shutting down the National Assembly in March of 2017. That was resisted by the people. There was, there was a massive outpouring of, uh, of protesters in the streets of Caracas, and that was uh, uh, they they stepped back from that uh, that process. Um, this was the moment at which. Uh, Christian Friedland, who had recently become minister, issued uh, a tweet calling on, Venice, on the Maduro government to restore democracy in Venezuela. Now, this um, government gets a lot of criticism for its use of Twitter for uh, foreign policy, but I can tell you that tweet had an absolutely electric effect in, um, in Venezuela and among those that uh, were following their political situation quite closely, because to use the terminology of a restoration of democracy and therefore admitting that democracy had been suspended. It was the first time that a major uh, hemispheric leader had, uh, had used that language, and it was immediately picked up by many, many other foreign ministers right afterwards. Um, a lot of the focus on the Canadian debate, uh, what Canada is doing in Venezuela is focused on what's happened in 2019, uh, but really the, the, the fundamental political commitment by Canada to make a strong stand on the issue of democracy in Venezuela came in March of 2017, so we've already been at this for, uh, for quite a long time. The protests continued in 2017. There were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets in Venezuela. Our embassy, unfortunately, uh, was um, located right in the principal square of Eastern Caracas where opposition forces tend to gather. In the 1990s, when Venezuela was primarily an, uh, um, an economic post, a post where we focused primarily on on trade issues, and we were seeking a uh, profile for Canada. It was a, a great choice for where, the, where to base an embassy. By 2017, it wasn't, didn't seem like such a great idea anymore. <laughs> a little bit like being in Egypt and having your embassy right on Tahrir Square. Um, so we closed the embassy for several months and operated out of the uh, official residence. But they had just absolute throngs of people in the street, day after day after day, and really quite a predictable pattern of uh, citizens filling the, the square in protest uh, in the late morning, early afternoon, and then the riot police coming in the late, uh, the late afternoon uh, with tear gas and sometimes, uh, sometimes worse, descending into uh, into pitched battles in the street in the uh, uh, as as nighttime fell. Uh, so this happened. This was day after day after day from March through to May, and then on May first, two thousand and seventeen, Maduro made a fateful uh, announcement, which was that the divisions in Venezuelan society had reached such a point that the, uh, the Los Clases Populares, the urban poor, um, now needed to take power directly into their own hands. He proposed a change to the Constitution which would essentially give uh, 
political power to the real people of Venezuela by the definition of uh, Chavistas, which is the, the urban poor. Um, essentially, the, the electoral system in place, which provided for a majority rule, uh, had to be suspended in order for the revolution to, uh, to continue. Um, the device by which this was to be accomplished was by, to create a new body called the Constituent Assembly, which would be placed above uh, all other elements, all, all other institutions of the Venezuelan state. Um, this was really quite an ingenious way to suspend a constitution because you could do so without formally suspending it. You're just creating another body uh, and putting it in, uh, uh, in charge. But the constituent assembly in most cases means a short-lived body whose job it is to draft a new constitution and then introduce that through some kind of referendum. In this case, there was no kind of referendum and there's been no constitution writing process. The constituent assembly has become a permanent body that can then overrule all the other elements of the Venezuelan state, including those that are elected through direct suffrage by the population. The constituent assembly is not elected on the principle of one person, one vote. It's uh, chosen through really quite a complex electoral scheme, which is essentially designed so that it could be easily manipulated uh, by Maduro. Um, Canada and some of the other countries that are devoted to the OAS charter principles of uh, human rights and uh, democracy um, strenuously objected to the creation of the Constituent Assembly. Uh, and then there was this remarkable exercise of civil disobedience where um, the parties that dominated the National Assembly organized a plebiscite on a nationwide level, much like a national election itself, although it wasn't done with the blessing of the state, uh, and managed to get eight million, almost eight million Venezuelans uh, to express their opinion on the legitimacy of the Constituent Assembly, in which case obviously 94% of them or something like that voted against the Constituent Assembly. So there was a really clear manifestation of rejection, widespread rejection by the Venezuelan population of this change to the Venezuelan Constitution. And yet it went ahead without a referendum, without any international observation uh, of, the, uh, of the election, and administered by a, uh, an electoral body that was controlled entirely by the, uh, by the president. That constituent assembly took power in July of 2017, uh, and so, I would argue that the, that the constitutional order in Venezuela was broken in uh, 2017. Uh, it's contentious to use the word coup d'etat, but it's a useful term to use to, uh, to convey that there has been a constitutional order by which there were sort of rules of the game that would mediate, um, mediate disputes and decide um, who was in power and who wasn't. That ended in July 31st. Uh, of 2017. So there has essentially been a constitutional vacuum in Venezuela ever since, uh, ever since then. This is the moment at which my ambassadorship ended and I moved out of Caracas and came back to, uh, to Ottawa, um, uh, to actually to move to Toronto. Um, and so subsequent to that, I don't have the direct experience to, to relay to you, but what I, uh, what I can recount is that uh, under this um, new constituent assembly. Uh, they passed changes to the electoral law, um, again to be overseen by a, a, an electoral uh, commission that was directly controlled by the president uh, with rules about access to the media and about election financing were extre extremely favorable uh, to Maduro. He then presented himself as a candidate for re-election in 2018. He had been democratically elected by most accounts in 2013, and his, uh, his term was due to end in January 2019. But in 2018, he advanced the, the date of the election, ran uh, an electoral exercise, which was essentially tailor-made in order to, uh, to maintain him in power. Again, made sure that there were no international observers uh, whatsoever. Most of the opposition candidates uh, chose to, to boycott some of those who chose not to, 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 uh, to boycott were thrown in jail. Uh, the principal rival was a, was a defector from the Chavista uh, movement himself. There was really no, no attributes of what would be considered a free and fair election that were present in the 2018 uh, election. Uh, and that term then, the first term, came to an end on January 10, 2019. That was the moment at which the National Assembly um, 
representing these the the, the, the last democratically elected um, institution of the Venezuelan state um, uh, declared Maduro an usurper and proposed that the president of the National Assembly, uh, Juan Guaido, uh, assume power as an interim president. And the rest uh, is history. I'll just finish my observations about the Venezuelan situation uh, right now to say that as a result of a 20-year experiment with populist politics, uh, citizens today in Venezuela have far more power, far less power than they ever did before. And on that basis, I think uh, it certainly can be argued that in the Venezuelan context, populism has been profoundly anti-democratic in, uh, in its results. Now, in 2016, as we were observing all this happening on the ground in Venezuela, uh, there were similar tactics being employed by uh, Donald Trump in his candidacy for uh, the presidency of the United States. They were being widely reported at the time as uh, surprising, uh, disruptive, innovative even by, by uh, some positive voices in the media, but generally as surprise. It's surprising that a candidate for the, for the presidency of the United States would be acting in some of those uh, some of those ways, but having observed what was going on in Venezuela, it, it was not particularly surprising uh, to to those of us on the ground. Those four same same characteristics that I mentioned before that characterize Chavez's approach to gaining and maintaining power were present in uh, the Trump methods. The first, emphasizing and even embracing the division in the nation. Now, obviously, the United States has been very polarized for quite a long time between red states and blue states, between Republicans uh, and Democrats. Uh, many presidents have tried to bridge those divides or have tried to create coalitions that would, uh, that would be able to bring them to power that would, uh, that would include uh, both states. Um, but President Trump does not. He embraces the, the division and uh, applies some of the same narrative of populism, that the, the, those are the red states are the real people the true people of the United States, and that the blue or the, the blue states are the, uh, are the coastal uh, elite. Um, there's that emphasis on division in all of the, pu the public rhetoric of, uh, of Donald Trump. Secondly, the claim that sovereignty is somehow under attack or somehow illusory. Now, of course, this is the United States, so they can't point to the United States for uh, interfering with their sovereignty. And so the, uh, the claim of sovereignty being under attack is launched against immigrants that we've lost control of our borders, that we're being overrun, that we're not able to, to determine what's happening in our country, that there are illegal immigrants that are voting for the Democrats. The same narrative of uh, sovereignty being somehow illusory also uh, is also prominent under, under, um, under Trump. The third is that governing by emotion, um, that uh, emphasis on uh, divisive narratives that bond the leader to his core constituency and then outrage the other and through both of those mechanisms place the president at the center of the attention uh, economy. So think about Charlottesville. Uh, white, there, it's hard to imagine a more divisive issue in American politics given all of its history than white supremacy. Uh, and yet from the very beginning when the head of the K Ku Klux Klan endorsed Donald Trump and Donald Trump claims to have not heard of the Ku Klux Klan or, or of David Duke. Um, <laughs> to going that step further in Charlottesville of saying that they're actually very fine people on both sides. There's a deliberate attempt to, to invoke some of the most divisive issues in uh, American politics. And I can only think the same will happen this last week with some of the moves of the uh, Alabama legislature uh, and many other states to introduce uh, abortion back into the national agenda. It's hard to imagine in the American context a more divisive issue than abortion, and yet division and controversy serves the interests of the populist leader. And then fourth, in terms of the, the, the fourth characteristic that the, the populist leader sees institutions as the problem and something to be, uh, to be dispensed with, um, we are seeing uh, moves to restrict access to, uh, uh, to voting rights among certain elements of the population. We are seeing um, an attempt to politicize the judicial system through the appointment certain judges. President Trump even refers to certain judges as Democratic judges or Republican judges. Of course, uh, very famously objected to one judge who issued 
uh, finding it against him by referring to him as a, as a Mexican. Um, there's a, unfortunately now that there's been such high profile bruising battles for the nomination of Supreme Court justices, a loss of confidence in the Supreme Court. Imagine if you're a progressive in the United States right now and there's a challenge to Roe v. Wade and that challenge is turned down, will you accept the legitimacy of the decision of the Supreme Court? That was probably not really in question for much of American history, but I think that will be in question now. And the, in, the United States is losing a proud element of its, of its, uh, of its uh, institutional um, legacy. Um, election, uh, sorry, the press being described as the enemy of the American people. The, the press obviously being an institution by which citizens can receive information to decide for themselves what's happening in, uh, in political life. Uh, and there's the same narrative against the executive branch, against bureaucrats, whether it's the State Department or intelligence officials, this idea that there's a, a deep <coughs> state that somehow the institutions of the American uh, government can't be trusted because they might uh, might provide a constraint, a constraint on, uh, on President Trump. Uh, perhaps the most alarming, I think, is the, uh, the moves recently by the Trump administration to reject the investigative power of the, of the US Congress. Um, this is just so reminiscent of the way that Maduro responded to the loss of uh, control that his party had in the Congress to not take that as a sign that it's time to negotiate or it's time to accommodate or try to come up with common solutions, but to reject the very legitimacy of the legislative branch uh, of the government. Now, this is much earlier days. Venezuela had 20 years of experience with populist uh, politics. Uh, <coughs> we're now only two and a half years into, uh, into Trump's um, presidency in the United States. Um, and so I think there's still hope for American democracy. And when I chose the title, How Democracies Die, we're referring to Venezuelan democracy. But I do think there are some serious warning signs in the United States um, that we should pay uh, heed to. And I do believe that American citizens are in the process of losing power in the way that Venezuelans uh, have lost power. Let me move quickly, because uh, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions to some observations uh, about Canada. Because I think that Canada is not going to be immune from some of the appeals of populism. Populism is a successful method for acquiring and for, for maintaining power. And so I do believe it's just a question of time until there are political aspirants in Canada that will employ some of these tactics. Uh, and if you look at the four elements that I've identified, the, uh, the claim that the country is fundamentally divided, uh, that our sovereignty is somehow illusory or under attack, um, that uh, of, of politicians that are ruling by emotion and, by, um, and deliberately trying to divide, and polarize, uh, and fourth, that institutions are strong. I think there's some um, some of these areas we need to be worried about, and some that I think Canada's probably okay for now. On this question of division, I mean, certainly there is plenty of material to work with in Canada. We, are, like all countries, are, have some fundamental divisions. We've historically been divided between English and French. We are obviously a very large country, and so there's uh, there's historical divisions between different regions in Canada, between east and west. And the framing of uh, some kind of contest between the elite and the people resonates with many Canadians. It seems intuitively correct that there are certain people that have more power than others, that have more money than others, and that are somehow co cooperating with, the, with one another. And, um, so the, the, the rhetoric could apply to Canada quite easily. On the claim that sovereignty under attack um, I don't think in the mainstream there is uh, all that much credibility, but there's certainly some voices on either side uh, that make that argument. I think for a long time on the left, there's been claims that the United States exerts an undue degree of influence over decisions that made in Canada that somehow were a puppet of, uh, of Washington. And on the right, I was really struck by some of the opposition, the vehemence of the opposition recently to the Global Compact on immigration, on migration which from my view as a professional diplomat was a real win for Canada that we managed to convince a hundred some other countries uh, to adopt uh, a similar language in an aspirational document that had no, no, uh, no binding effect on Canada. But like, shouldn't we all try and figure out a way of coordinating common migration policies? Wouldn't that be a win? Wouldn't that actually help us create more control over, uh, over migration issues? But the demonization of the global compact for migration by some on the right saying that this was the UN somehow taking over, that Canada was ceding its sovereignty. 
I found dangerously reminiscent of, uh, of populist anti-democratic rhetoric. That said, I, I don't yet see in any of the major political candidates, the major candidates for, for prime minister, um, uh, a populist leader as defined by a leader who is appealing to only one segment of the population, claiming that the country is fundamentally divided and uh, that I will uh, I will champion the cause of one portion of Canadian society in an in a ongoing and eternal battle with the, the other part of Canadian society. There may be more minor political leaders in Canada, but of the three most likely men that could end up as Prime Minister after uh, October 2019, I don't yet see that. And I do actually believe that our institutions uh, are strong. Um, certainly having lived in Venezuela for four years to come back to Canada, uh, there may be some uh, hand-wringing about the state of our media, some hand-wringing about, uh, about the courts, um, but in comparison, I think they're doing quite strong, quite well. And if you think about the most significant scandal in, in uh, recent Canadian political history, the SNC-Lavalin scandal, this was uh, a test case for the rule of law. Uh, and regardless of your views of what the legitimacy of Justin Trudeau um, exerting some kind of pressure over, uh, over Jeremy Wilson Raybould, press for a deferred prosecution in the SNC-Lavalin affair. The point is that he failed to convince her to do it. The Prime Minister of the country was not able to convince his own direct subordinate, the Minister of Justice, uh, to take an, an issue that was well within, with, well within legal, uh, legal bounds uh, to do. And so, if anything, I think Canada demonstrated with the SNC-Lavalin, not only the institutions are strong, but look at the, the strength of the public reaction, the loss of support of the Liberal government and the the disappointment that so many Canadians feel in the Prime Minister. I think that shows our extremely deep commitment to the rule of law in this country. It may be an embarrassing story for Justin Trudeau, but I think it's a story that Canadians can take pride in the reaction they've had to SNC Lavalin. Yet, yeah, um, I don't think that we can be immune and therefore we can't rest on our loyals, laurels. This is a political uh, strategy that has succeeded in many, many countries, in countries that are very similar to ours. And I think we need to be vigilant to make sure that it doesn't take root here in Canada. So if the four characteristics that I mentioned of populism uh, are to emphasize division, to claim that illusion, uh, sovereignty is illusory, to govern by uh, emotion, uh, and to, to polarize through, uh, through this kind of appeal to divisive moments in our history, uh, and to weaken institutions, we can essentially adopt the opposite strategy. On the first, while there certainly are fundamental divisions in our country, I think one easy thing that all Canadians could do to, uh, to offset the appeal of populism is to, uh, to try and remain united and to remind ourselves of our shared citizenship. That when we engage in debates, we certainly aren't going to agree on everything, but when we debate, whether it's immigration, whether it's economic policy, whether it's the future of our relationship with the United States, we should do so as Canadians. If we're going to disagree with each other, let's at least recognize the validity of the uh, claim that the other Canadian has to their opinion as a fellow citizen. Secondly, uh, to those that say that our sovereignty is illusory or under attack, I think the uh, appropriate response is for Canadians to become informed about our international relations and to understand the extent of our sovereignty and perhaps even debate for how we should use our sovereignty. We have a role in the world to play. We're the 10th largest economy. We're a G7 country. Uh, we have uh, alliances and uh, we're members of multilateral institutions. We have a capacity to change outcomes in the world and we should embrace our sovereignty and debate what we should be doing with it. Third, uh, to the extent that there are politicians that will be appealing to emotions, it's a natural for, uh, for all political life, uh, we do have an opportunity to resist that. Each of us is a publisher, a press publisher in our own right, thanks to social media. Uh, those of us that have Facebook accounts, that have Twitter accounts, will invariably receive messages in our feeds that will uh, inflame us, that will either make us really like one politician or really detest another politician. Each of us has a choice whether to share that content or not. Uh, what I would recommend that everyone do is to wait for at least 30 seconds, for 30 <laughs> minutes if possible. Wait until the next time you log on to Facebook before you decide to share that. It, particularly if it's, uh, if it's material um, that's going to uh, reinforce your connection to one political party or to demonize another political party. Even if it's 
uh, true what the content uh, is, and you should certainly try and apply some of the filters of wondering whether it's actually fake news, but even if it's true, is it actually useful for you to send to send that to your friends and to inflame uh, decision? It's a, it's a decision, it's a, a choice that each of us has to make. Um, I'd also like to uh, offer the perspective um, that in combating populism, the responsibility each of us uh, uh, has to become active citizens, uh, to embrace our own role in the democratic process is something that the CIC might be able to help with. This is an institution that's designed for citizens to become more active in uh, educating themselves about Canada and Canada's role in the world. It's a nonpartisan uh, institution, but it also has no particular policy preferences. We're not trying to argue for one particular view of free trade or one particular view of human rights. All perspectives are welcome in the CIC, and therefore it's a, it's a venue through which we as Canadians can engage with one another and to learn to disagree with uh, one another, but always doing so mindful of our shared Canadian citizenship. We've got this tremendous history of 90 years of operating. We're in 15 cities across the, uh, across the country. So the CIC offers opportunities for each of you to connect with other Canadian citizens from coast to coast. Secondly, it's all about international affairs. It's all about what Canada's sovereignty actually means and what we can do with it. The CIC's mission can be more or less described as debating, allowing Canadian citizens to debate what Canada's role should be in the world. In other words, what should we do with the sovereignty that we do actually enjoy? How can we enhance it? How can we project it? And what do we represent as a, as a nation? Third, while um, we'll all be uh, prone to emotional arguments in uh, politics, uh, I believe that the CIC offers us an opportunity for us to engage in rational debate on uh, different policy perspectives and to have a dispassionate consideration about what might be good or bad for, uh, for our country. Uh, and finally, on the institutions that ultimately determine whether we remain a democracy uh, or not, uh, we have the opportunity through the CIC and as citizens to try and uh, to, to strengthen and update institutions. Um, the institutions that we have been, that we have inherited from our forebears are old and they are out of date and there is some validity that they no longer are well suited for dealing with some of the, the disruptions that we're experiencing as a society thanks to the digital economy, thanks to growing inequality and all the other social and economic ills that we face. But the response to that shouldn't be to reject the institutions but rather to learn uh, how to make them better and to engage ourselves in the contest to make them better. At a minimum through voting, uh, there's also an opportunity to, uh, to, to volunteer to become more active in your community. Um, and I would also like to encourage that you think of the CIC as an opportunity for this. For those of you that are here just as guests today, please consider becoming members of the CIC and being exposed to more discussions like the one that we're having tonight. For those of you that are already members, please consider taking things one step further and perhaps volunteering for the executive of the CIC. There's been a real uh, process of renewal and uh, in the, the executive committee of, the, uh, of CIC Vancouver. Um, but there are m more jobs to be filled, there's a lot more work to be done, there are more events that could be organized and you could have a role in determining what kind of topics should be discussed here in Vancouver, which kinds of speakers uh, should be here. Those of you that have, uh, that have means to help us build what we're doing at the national level with the National Speakers Program by which we send people from CIC branch to CIC branch are certainly uh, welcome to talk to me about other roles that you might be able to play. We're forming an advisory board of people that have played significant roles in Canada's international affairs and those that want to play a more significant role in trying to inject ideas into the national debate, into this discussion of 1,200 members that the CIC represents, from Halifax all the way to Victoria and soon in Whitehorse, if our current plans uh, play out very well uh, as, as planned. Um, and there's roles that you can play into try and injecting uh, ideas into that, uh, into that discussion. I'm confident that just as uh, in the 1930s when Canada was, um, was presented with alternate modes of how to organize our society and how to run a political system of our country, uh, we, stayed true to, we stayed true to liberal democracy. I'm confident that in this similar period of disruption and of disorder and of instability with other rivals to liberal democracy that we will stay true to those principles and that we will find a way to update them to the 21st century, but it won't be done purely by our political leaders or by uh, 
by civil senior civil servants in Canada. It will be done by all of us working together. And whether you do that through the CIC, as I dearly hope you will, or in other opportunities that you have as Canadian citizens, the role of resist the, the responsibility of resisting populism and renewing Canadian democracy for the 21st century lies with all of us. And I invite you to embrace that role. Thank you. take any questions. If you permit me, since I always feel a bit of an imposter talking about Venezuela in the presence of uh, people that know that country much better and that have likely suffered the consequences of what happened to that country, I'd like to invite some of our Venezuelan friends to uh, ask the first question. Por favor. Well, first of all, I, I'm really thankful and impressed of the um, framework that providing all of us to understand um, and in the big picture to understand exactly the dynamics of uh, the transition from democracy to non-democracy and the underlying causes of it. Um, I would, um, the, so it was really impressive for me. And then how you related it to the US because sometimes I They're obviously very yeah, different yeah, ideologically. No, 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 but it's more the methodology that they no, and apply. And I really uh, appreciate that you take it with humility, saying that it can happen even to Canada, and, and that's really, I'm very, very moved and thankful for being here and being yeah. done. The, the, the only, so I'm taking advantage of all your wisdom and, and to look up towards the future, right? Because yeah. The only thing that I that I would add to your um, explanation of Venezuela uh, dynamics, or let's say approach from Maduro and Chavez to was I would talk a little. I'm an economist and I have a column in Venice and on Universal and, and, Universal. and uh, I write every Sunday. So I would have also you you mentioned it the exchange control yeah. and the price controls and the lack of medicine and the lack of the, the, the oil, uh, the prices of oil went down in 2014, 15, mm -hmm. but the crisis was created by the foreign exchange control and the price controls. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, the populism came with the central bank pump and printing money in yeah. the economy. So that's what really- yeah, I didn't mention hyperinflation. Yeah, but, but, but that was the real knife <coughs> that, that killed the whole economy. Because yeah. in Venezuela we've had you know crazy governments all the time, but free, <laughs> but with the free markets, nobody yeah. cares, right? It's like in Italy, they do whatever they want to do. The economy is working well, and but here that he used like a poison, he used foreign exchange control plus price. And that was control. as early as 2003, if I remember. No, I know, but but then he he should have everybody told him to because in two thousand and three there was so much oil revenue that nobody <coughs> cared either, and, yeah. and and the free the black market and the free market the the, the discrepancy was, was not too big. Yeah, it was in six thousand versus six six dollars versus six thousand mm -hmm. uh, boilers per dollar, so it wasn't ten times a, a, yeah. a thousand times. It was much manageable, right? Yeah. And so, well, that's just a little <coughs> comment on, on that. I Thank think you. that was a real knife to kill that not only democracy was killed, but also free markets, yeah. which is, which is, because democracy has always, I mean, we were 
on the future mm -hmm. there's a uh, so now Trump as uh, all against Maduro and Maduro is all against Trump and, and there's the whole world trying to I, I was listening today to Almagro uh, the secretary of the saying that the dialogue, the way it was managed by the Europeans and was not done properly because they put periods or they lapses for doing the dialogues or yeah. reaching agreement. And then those those lapses uh, reached to the limit and they extended again and they extended. So, so and on the other hand, the U.S. is <coughs> also not doing the right thing because they threaten with military action and then they don't take it. So it's all strengthening Maduro in a way and, mm -hmm. and crushing more people. So it's better not to have any intervention from abroad. And so yeah. what, how do you see that? Those forces play in the future. I should ask, actually, in the back, are you able to hear the question or do you need me to repeat it? No, I got it on there. You got it, okay. Uh, we can't hear you. Okay, so if I could summarize, I think the question is about uh, uh, what, uh, what I think about the efforts now to, to mediate between the uh, Maduro regime and the Guaido uh, administration, there have been uh, negotiation attempts that have been uh, uh, overseen by various international bodies. Uh, one of them is called the International Contact Group, which is, I think, the one that was being criticized by the Secretary General of the OAS. Uh, and the question is whether the mediation itself, uh, uh, having flawed mediation that just allows Maduro to remain in power and basically to rag the puck, to use a Canadian sports metaphor for, uh, for how he's approaching these negotiations, is uh, worse than not having any negotiations yeah. at all. One other point. Canada is playing a very critical role in that. I think by its luck or by, uh, I don't know what, but Canada has a, like a very important role right now mm -hmm. because Canada is the main source of revenue of Cuba. Cuba has is the one running the Venezuelan government, and I know Trudeau is doing a good job with uh, Friedland, or Friedland. Mm -hmm. the, the minister, to approaching Cuba, trying to I don't know what kind of talks they have, but certainly Cuba knows that yeah. Cuba depends more on Canada than, than on Venezuela, so I'm not so if you could yeah. put all that together. Uh, so my response on mediation is it definitely needs to be done right. It can be, it can actually be counterproductive to to have mediation if it's not um, if it's not actually going to produce uh, a positive outcome. And there is a long history of negotiations between uh, the government and the opposition that have uh, have been managed precisely to try and drag the time out and so that the uh, that the protests die down or that the, the energy. Uh, in the streets uh, abates. Um, I believe that uh, mediation is necessary, that uh, there's not likely to be a definitive political victory of one or the other, and I certainly don't want there to be a, a, a military contest uh, between um, the forces of Maduro and the forces of, uh, of Guaido, and so that means that there needs to be uh, mediation. But I believe that they should be uh, conducted under the rubric of the responsibility to protect which means that not only do we uh, ask the Maduro government to acknowledge their own responsibility to, to protect Venezuelan citizens, but that we in the international community have a responsibility if the Maduro government proves unwilling or unable to. I think if we invoke R2P, as we should in this case, explicitly ruling out unilateral military intervention, which is uh, not allowed under, under the, the, uh, the, the classic understanding of R2P, um, that would place the international mediation efforts in a very different light, uh, because the mediation would then be, the success of the mediation would actually be a responsibility of the international uh, uh, community. That if they don't succeed, then the international community needs to move to some other kinds of measures. Uh, R2P, I also think, helps to place emphasis on what the most important uh, element in the Venezuelan crisis right now, which is the humanitarian crisis and the unnecessary deaths of now thousands of people per year uh, as a result of that. I think it would inject a new urgency to the regional and to some extent international um, 
response to the, the Venezuelan crisis right now. At this point, the fact that there is the international contact group, which is completely separate from the Lima group, and again, completely separate from the OAS, uh, represents an unhealthy kind of fracturing of the regional and international response to, uh, to Venezuela. And that is playing into Maduro's hands in that uh, a divided international community uh, is not going to have the same kind of ability to compel uh, change on the ground inside, inside Venezuela. I think there are some things that we could do about that. I think if we focus primarily on the humanitarian crisis, we should actually be able to bring together the efforts of the Lima group, to which Canada belongs, and the international contract group, so that you then would have uh, all of Latin America, except for Cuba, uh, in a coordinated approach. The Trudeau government is trying to negotiate with Cuba. I don't hold out much hope for there being a change in the Cuban position, because this is uh, an, an area they find absolutely central to their national security in the way that the Cuban, uh, Cuban government defines it. But if you're at least able to have the other 33 countries of the, of the hemisphere united behind a common approach um, that will not allow uh, the, the time limits of, of mediation um, to, be, to be run out without consequence, that there should be an ability to mobilize more action at the international level. Other questions? Yes, Steve. So, um, coming from Venezuela, one of the things that I experienced um, is how hard it takes for people to realize what's happening. Yeah. Um, to realize that they're actually going under a transition that may potentially be you know, the, the piece of existence for that economy. And that's how I felt back in 2000, you know, the early 2000 years. <laughs> yeah, things were happening slowly, but people really didn't uh, consider what was happening and didn't really take seriously that that could become what it actually is right now. So my question is, what can other countries, like you're mentioning now, the US that have similarities, you mentioned quite a few, another one that I should point out is how Trump is going to control the, uh, uh, the Fed rate, you know, mm -hmm. raising, raising rates, he's going to control things with the things that also uh, yeah. are based out in Venezuela, but um, what would you say could be things that people could do to create more awareness of what things could potentially become, and also when somebody says, yeah, well, you know, that's something possible to happen, you know, to actually, Stop people from saying that and say more like, oh, that's actually a possibility. What can we do about that? So one thing I've noticed in uh, the Venezuelan crisis, and I think this is probably true in international relations more generally, is uh, our tendency as outsiders to impose our own narrative on what's happening and to see in the crisis of, a, of another country, of Venezuela, um, some narrative that we are, are more concerned about at the, at the international level. Uh, and that plays out differently depending on where you are on the political spectrum. So generally on the left, um, many people in the Canadian left uh, and the United States and Europe uh, uh, also see this, the Venezuelan crisis primarily as a potential situation of yet another illegitimate American military intervention. So they look at Venezuela and they think Iraq 2003, they think uh, Libya 2012, they think uh, of, uh, of other military interventions and the uh, if, if that's the framing that you're giving, then the answer must be, we must prevent a U.S. military intervention, uh, and perhaps you know some go even further and then uh, and then uh, excuse the Maduro government for some of the, the abuses that they're uh, making. Um, on the right, uh, there's certainly many people that are trying to use the Venezuelan crisis as some kind of lesson in the evils of socialism, and therefore trying to apply it to their own country. That you know we can't trust the left in our country because it'll end up with uh, Venezuela as if that story mattered more than the deaths of thousands of Venezuelans because of lack of access to, to health care. And so one general lesson I think to be learned is let us do everything in our power to try and understand the crisis that's happening in one particular country through the perspective of the people that are from that country. And my favorite hashtag in Twitter over this entire few months of the, uh, of the, the, the recent phase of the Venezuelan crisis was hashtag ask a Venezuelan. Um, it's something that I think all of us should do. In fact, it's actually quite easy to do uh, on social media because it's not hard to find Venezuelan voices. Just use hashtag Ask a Venezuela and you'll get hundreds and hundreds of perspectives uh, from Venezuela. So that's one thing that, that, uh, that I think uh, that, uh, that all of us should, uh, should, should have the discipline to do, to make that effort to truly put ourselves in the, in, the, uh, in the situation of Venezuela and understand things from their perspective. But yeah. <laughs> Yes, um, so there's certainly some irony uh, to the criticisms of 
the United States in, uh, in Venezuela. I'd, I'm an ardent opponent of any <coughs> US military intervention, certainly unilateral inter uh, military intervention um, in uh, the United States. But the fact is that it hasn't actually happened yet. The fear is that there will be in the future. Whereas right now, there is a military intervention by Venezuela in support of the Maduro regime and against the wishes of the vast majority of the, uh, Venezuelan uh, citizens. Uh, it's also notable that, that Russia has more or less uh, purchased uh, vast amounts of the oil and gas output of Venezuela for many, many decades to come. There is a degree of debt uh, that the Maduro government owes to Russia, and that if there's a transition of power in Caracas, the incoming administration uh, is uh, going to owe so much to Russia that even the profits that it would that it would earn from the sale of, uh, of oil and gas will essentially be diverted uh, to Moscow. There's some ironies in the situation that uh, Russia is essentially doing the things that the United States, that people fear that the United States would do if they got the chance, but they're already doing it uh, right now. I do find it kind of extraordinary that Russia has the degree of influence that it has in, uh, in Venezuela right now, um, given the lack of any kind of significant historical relationship between the two countries and the, the you know, it's really quite a distant player and doesn't, um, doesn't have that much of, a, of an influence in Latin America. Um, and it is genuinely a, a, a negative influence on what's happening in Venezuela. Um, so the, the kind of uh, messages that I've been advocating for how the international community should respond to Venezuela um, is that we should be against any unilateral uh, military interventions in the future and also ask those countries that are already intervening militarily in Venezuela to withdraw from that country. In the very back. Um, Brazil, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, all being bid for that triple threat to swap chain models for closing the banking system yeah. and the oil structure. Mm -hmm. How do you see those kind of secrecy and secret technologies interacting, influencing the trade with the global elite? Ah, this is a very good question. Uh, Venezuela, the Venezuelan government under Maduro has introduced something called the Petro, which is a, uh, a cryptocurrency. The idea is just the Bolivar is uh, subject to such crazy hyperinflation. Um, even if it's a sort of wild west in cryptocurrencies, it wouldn't be quite as wild as, uh, as the current uh, currency situation. My understanding is that the Petro is really more um, theory than reality in Venezuela, that uh, there isn't there isn't a very active uh, trading in the, uh, in the Petro. Um, and so this is more in the realm of what might eventually happen as opposed to what's happening uh, right now. Um, uh, I'd say it's a, um, a risky uh, situation for Venezuela to engage in um, that kind of experimentation with its economy when there are some pretty dire uh, uh, immediate challenges. My recommendation for, uh, for stabilizing the monetary situation in Venezuela would be actually a, a, the adoption of the, of the US dollar, much as Ecuador itself uh, stabilized its economy after a similar crisis in, uh, in 1999. That would at least introduce a whole lot more predictability um, in the, the prices in, of Venezuela and be something that's sort of readily understandable rather than going down the, the route of, uh, of cryptocurrencies. Yes. 
So there's certainly an approach to comparative political uh, analysis um, that argues that there are different political cultures, and some cultures are perhaps more um, resistant to uh, authoritarian rule, for example, than others. Uh, just earlier today, when I was in, uh, giving a similar talk to CIC Victoria, uh, one of the questions was that uh, certain countries, like in Eastern Europe, are just more prone to want a strong leader uh, that, uh, that can be followed. I certainly heard those arguments uh, for many years when I was posted in the Arab world as well. Is there something about Arab political culture that, that people expect there to be a strong leader or anticipate that there's a strong leader or want a strong leader? Um, I have to say I'm skeptical. I've been in many different countries and many different uh, um, political cultures. Uh, and I, I think there, there's stronger explanatory power um, in the techniques that political leaders use to, uh, to uh, acquire power. Um, my observation about it, though, is there's actually very deep commitment to human rights and democracy, one of the deepest in, uh, in all of Latin America. Um, and so for there to, for democracy to have died there, I think uh, suggests that it's uh, something that could happen anywhere. Um, there, there can't have been a stronger, prouder democracy in, uh, in Latin America than, uh, than Venezuela. Um, so I don't think any of us are particularly prone to authoritarian rule and, or uh, to populist rule, and I also don't think any of us are immune. Um, I don't think there's any inevitability one way or the other. I think it's a, it's, uh, a fight that every country has to fight, every uh, political system and every group of citizens has to has essentially um, lead this fight in order to protect democracy and to, and to pose populism and authoritarianism. Yes? Yeah, sorry, Canadian question. So, um, last year, I think, Yeah, that was a pretty disturbing incident. So for those of you that didn't hear about it, there was a, an incident, I hope it was just once, I'm not sure if it's repeated, where when Premier Ford in Ontario was giving a press conference, um, conservative staffers were uh, making so much noise that it was difficult for the journalists to actually ask the questions and therefore the Premier to be held to, uh, to account. I, th I think the appropriate response is for us to double down on our support for free media. Um, I think it's gotten to the stage now that actually paying for a subscription to a newspaper of your choice is an act of citizenship <laughs> and something that each of us uh, should consider. I wouldn't advocate any one newspaper because I think there should be a debate about which, uh, about how news is reported, but I, I think we can take a stand by actually supporting uh, newspapers uh, or uh, television and broadcast media um, uh, and finding other ways of holding political leaders to, the account, to account. If they refuse to be held to account in one particular format, which is a press conference, then let's redouble our efforts to bring them to, to hold them to account in whatever other areas that we have available. Yes? You haven't touched upon um, the embargoes that have been imposed on Venezuela by yes, the US. Thank you for the oversight there. Yes, and, thank you. Um, and, and, the, and the effect that they might have had on the lack of food and medicines in Venezuela. Could you please clarify that for us? I will. It's actually relatively simple. The, embargo uh, that the United States has imposed on Venezuelan oil took effect on April 1st, 2019, six weeks ago. There was no embargo on any uh, the sale of Venezuelan oil into the United States. In fact, the United States was by far the largest purchaser of Venezuelan uh, oil. Um, but they can't transfer the funds. They can't. There were financial sanctions. The, 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 bank. the financial sanctions were introduced in mid-2017 by the Trump administration. And those are both uh, measures that essentially punish the, 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 the Venezuelan people by targeting the economy. Um, I do believe that the oil embargo in particular is misguided and should be, uh, should be uh, suspended. Uh, under this rubric of responsibility to protect, my argument is that the international community should approach the Venezuelan situation primarily as a humanitarian crisis and prioritize all of our efforts in order to alleviate the humanitarian crisis. And one immediate measure the United States could do would be to lift the oil embargo. But I do want to make uh, clear 
the chronology here, that the Venezuelan uh, economy started to collapse in 2014, and that the first US economic sanctions were introduced in 2017. That anecdote that I gave, or the, the stat that I gave about the loss of weight, the average loss of weight of Venezuelans was in 2016, before any US economic sanctions. Um, I believe there, there's certainly a, 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 a trend in reporting about, or in commenting about Venezuela that perhaps the United States is at fault for the economic collapse of the country. Um, I believe there's a few reasons for that. One of them is that certainly Maduro's explanation, uh, and there has been Venezuelan media attempts to, to, you know, to pass that narrative. There's also the precedent of Cuba, where for many, many years there has been Cuba. Uh, and I think it's all too easy for us as Canadians to assume that because it's happening in one Latin American country, it must be more or less the same thing. But it has not at all been the case in Venezuela. There was no economic sanctions of any kind. The Venezuela, Venezuelan oil was sold to the United States uh, more than to any other country. And so to hold U.S. economic policy uh, responsible for the economic calamity in Venezuela is, is historically uh, inaccurate, um, and I think uh, does a disservice to the people that are suffering from the consequence of those. It's not U.S. Um, economic decisions that uh, that have caused the crisis. There are the economic decisions that they've now taken are exacerbating the crisis and should be relieved. But the responsibility for the collapse of the Venezuelan economy rests very, very squarely with the Venezuelan government. Yeah. There is another issue in that regard that. The corruption, the, and the, the oil company is so huge, it's like billions and billions. It's sending the whole world. So, so they have to. I mean, there has to be some stop to that kind of money laundering in a amount of hundreds of billions of dollars. Corruption is endemic, like always endemic in Venezuela. Well, but not at this level. There's a certain. There's a, a, there's a scale. It's a. As I, I mentioned with the the exchange rates, so the, the sort of like it's like it's like uh, the drug lords moving more money all around the world. It's the same thing in the U.S. Yeah. It's a, I'm not in favor of sanctions. I agree with Mariko where I think that the U.S. I mean there should be like a treasury, uh, international treasury managing the you know right. accepting who are the vendors. I'll take one last question, if I may. Yes, over here. Yes, uh, thank you, by the way, for the presentation. And uh, I just want to, to know a little more about what Canada is um, looking into the future. We, we just mentioned the, the consequential in the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela, and also to support the mediation um, of, of the conflict in the national uh, setting. But what is the plan of, uh, for the cap for Canada to support not just Venezuela but future situations in other Latin American countries, not only now the population of of is coming more populous. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and this populism yeah. of the right as we're seeing in the right. Yeah. And elsewhere. So uh, I, I've argued that there are three key components of the Canadian response to Venezuela that I think are notable, uh, that, that just uh, uh, demonstrate the legitimacy of the Canadian approach in Venezuela and that are potentially replicable to other cases of, uh, of uh, democratic, um, uh, democratic movements. Um, the first is that uh, we focus primarily on the citizens of a country as the the legitimate holders of sovereignty, that to the extent that um, uh, we're talking about Venezuelan sovereignty, the sovereignty that matters is that of the, of the individual uh, people, not the state itself, but the uh, popular sovereignty of Venezuelans. The second is that we don't lead or impose any kind of political uh, change or any kind of political preferences. Our role is to follow and to support uh, the, the, uh, the democracy movement in the country. 
Uh, and the third is that we should always do so in good company with other, uh, with other countries, and particularly the neighbors of the country. And that's sort of the, the origins of the, uh, of the Lima Group. I believe that those three elements provide a recipe that we can apply in other countries. It does set the bar very, very high. Uh, there's not many cases that you have almost 8 million people participating in a plebiscite to demonstrate their opposition of constitutional change, as has been the case in Venezuela. It's, to me, quite clear that there is uh, a widespread support for a political position, uh, the, the position of the National Assembly and its leader, Juan Guaido, uh, and therefore it's, it, it's uh, feasible for Canada to follow the lead of Venezuelan citizens because it's been made so evident in uh, the Venezuelan case. Um, when it comes to the humanitarian situation, the Trudeau government has announced uh, $53 million in humanitarian assistance. Unfortunately, because uh, we have no way of distributing that within Venezuela, the bulk of that will go to Venezuelan uh, uh, immigrants in Colombia and in Brazil, in other countries where, frankly, there are significant humanitarian needs as well. Um, the, there is an urgent need, though, to get humanitarian assistance into Venezuela to deliver food and medicine uh, and to restore the, the power system. Uh, currently, the hopes for that lie with the Red Cross. Uh, the, Venez the Maduro government broke with years and years of practice by uh, accepting humanitarian assistance after having refused it uh, categorically in all other cases as some kind of infringement of Venezuelan sovereignty. And so that Red Cross mission is just now being stood up. And I am certain that the amount of support already going into the Red Cross uh, effort will be woefully in inadequate compared to the actual requirements uh, of the Venezuelan population. So I do hope that Canada will consider providing more than the $53 million that we have, uh, we have already provided. Um, I believe that there's probably already planning being done, but if not, uh, we should advance planning for the economic reconstruction of Venezuela after uh, a transition of government. This is a, uh, a country that's lost almost two-thirds of its GDP, and so the, the, the requirement to put it back on its feet, that will be a, a long and arduous, uh, uh, arduous process, uh, but it will be essential for the, for the prosperity of all of uh, uh, Latin America for that, to, uh, for that to take place. With that, I'm going to... Uh, Thank you for your attention tonight. It's been a, a long evening and uh, a very long presentation as I've talked about three different countries. And so I wanted to thank you for your, uh, for your, uh, your, your patience and for some excellent questions tonight. I'll remain after the <laughs>